everyone. Uh, a very good evening to you all. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you to the first phase of Dialogues. It's an initiative by the Rotary uh, Colombo East and the Rotary Club of Colombo East. Uh, here in Dialogues, we all aim to dissect issues pertaining to peace and reconciliation in Sri Lanka and foster a greater uh, culture of dialogue, openness, and uh, among all Sri Lankans to create reconciliation among them uh, through citizenship and heritage. Uh, our moderator for this phase uh, is an esteemed personality herself. She is an attorney at law with focus in the areas of family law, labor law, commercial law, constitutional law, and the area of women's right litigation. She has been a part of numerous legal teams that have made a number of strides in terms of legal advances and presented papers on LGBT rights in Sri Lanka at the South Asian Women's Convergence 2016, which was held in Nepal. She's an avid activist with significant contributions to both women's and children's rights, a lecturer on legal studies, and an outspoken advocate of peace and unity. Um, our president, Rotractor Fabian Schockman's teacher, and he's very much, very much glad to have you, Ms. Jerusha, on board. Uh, so welcome, Ms. Jerusha. Thank you for taking part. Uh, in yet another venture uh, that, uh, that's organized by the Road Track Club of Colombo East. I'm honored to be here. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, and this evening, for our first dialogue, we have with us uh, the rightful Honorable Michael Morris, the Lord Naseby, who is a Privy Councillor. Born Michael Wolfgang Lawrence Morris in 1936, he was educated at Bedford School before graduating with an honours degree in economics from St. Catherine's College, Cambridge. He served the Royal Air Force and NATO as a pilot from 1955 to 1957. During his time with the Rekhid and Coleman Group, he worked in both India and Sri Lanka. He first stood for public office in 1966. He has been a member of the House of Commons since 1975 and sat on numerous committees before being elected in 1992 as the chairman of the Ways and Means Committee and Deputy Speaker. In 1994, Her Majesty appointed him a Privy Councillor. Lord Naseby was raised to peerage as Baron Naseby of Sandy in the county of Bedfordshire, 1997. He is a working peer who has sat on a wide variety of committees. Currently, he serves on standing orders and is a trustee of the Parliamentary Contributory Pension Fund. He speaks regularly and asks pertinent oral questions. He maintains his lifelong interest in Sri Lanka as president of the parliamentary group. He's also the president of the Lords and Commons Parliamentary Golfing Society and treasurer of the tennis group. Outside of his political life, Lord Naseby was the chairman of the Bedford School Governors from 1988 to 2002, the Invesco Recovery Trust Limited from 1995, uh, the Child's Mutual Friendly Society from 1997 to 2005, and was a non-executive director of Mensal Limited from 1990, 1998 to 2003. He is a trustee of the Victoria County History Society, president of the Northamptonshire County Cricket Club, patron of the Cromwell Museum, which was formerly paid and was formerly patron of the Naseby Battlefield Project Trust from 2008 to 2014. He was also honoured with a fellowship in history from Northampton University in 2007. He was also awarded the Bernardo O'Higgins Medal from the Republic of Chile in 2013 
and was awarded the highest national honour afforded to non-citizens by Sri Lanka, the Sri Lanka Ratna in 2005. We are indeed honoured to have such wonderful and accomplished human beings for this panel discussion. And with these introductions, I would like our moderator, Ms. Jerusha, to take over the panel discussion. Yes. Thank you, Shahani. And welcome, Lord Naseby. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Very good. Yeah. So I think it's no secret, Lord Naseby, that you have been a friend and ally of our little island for a long time. I think it's over 50 years. Is that correct? That's right. Uh, yes. And you've sat, yeah, you've sat on many groups in parliament, also overseeing the country. Uh, I want to know from you, aside from the parliamentary um, oversight that you do on our behalf, what is it that appeals to you about our little island and our people? I first came, as you heard, in uh, uh, May 1964. Oh. I was sent from my, by my borough staff in Calcutta to the beautiful... And Calcutta was not a beautiful city. It has a lot of attributes, but it's not. And I'd been looking after Uttar Pradesh, Bihar, Orissa, and the eastern India. And I flew into, uh, into Ratmalana Airport and with my wife, uh, baby son, little dog, and a shotgun. And I was told by a friend, if you take a shotgun, the customs in Sri Lanka, well, uh, well it was Ceylon then, uh, will be much more interested in the shotgun than anything else. And they were right. And I had seven months to sort out a problem that Reckitt and Coleman had. I toured the whole island. I hired an elephant to remove some machinery at our Rat Milana, uh, factory. I learned to uh, stay overnight uh, and tour using the rest houses. And because we sold products to the government, I persuaded the authorities uh, that we should be used, I could use the circuit bungalows as well. Uh, and that was a magical time. And I met one really magical Sri Lankan, a man called Ananda de Tissa de Alwis. Ananda de Tissa de Alwis. At that point, head of J. Walter Thompson Advertising, later Member of Parliament, later Speaker of your Parliament. I became only the Deputy Speaker. But there was an immediate rapport, and it was his fault. He lit the candle that got me into politics. And I, I had a magical seven months. And then I had to go back to the UK and change jobs. And following that, I had 10 years trying to get into the UK Parliament, and I got there in February 74, and almost the first thing I did was to start the all-party British Sri Lanka group. Thank you, Lord Naseby. Yeah, it goes further than we even expected, so it's a very old relationship. And uh, not only has it been a good one, but you've also been known to always stand uh, for us and uh, always speak on our behalf, and we're very grateful for that. Thank you. Uh, Lord Nesby, I also understand from reading up a little bit about uh, when I looked at your profile that you're also an ardent cricket enthusiast, which is, uh, you, is something you have in common with all of us Islanders. We are big cricket fans as well. Um, I saw that you headed a couple of cricket committees through Parliament, golf, not. tennis. Ah. You, were, you were a part of some cricket committees through parliament. I saw golf, yes, tennis and yes, cricket indeed. as well. Yeah. And so I take that you are a cricket fan, just like us, many of us. Uh, I can modestly say that my, one of my very best friends was a man called Gamani Disanaka. Yeah. The late Gamani Disanaka, MP. Naka. He was in my home where I'm speaking from now on a visit. Yeah. He knew that I was, uh, at that point, captain of the parliamentary uh, cricket team. And we got to discussing about how we could ensure that Sri Lanka, with all its talent in cricket, could become a test nation. And we sat down in the next door room to where I'm coming and speaking from now and agreed that I would deal with the look after 
and get on side. The MCC, which is where um, that dear old uh, Sankakara is now as our president. The ECB, uh, which is the controlling body, and also the Department of Sport in the UK. And he would look after the international side. And we did a lot of work together. And that joyous day in 1984, when we had the first test match at Lord's Cricket Gown, and I was the guest of your then High Commissioner. Thank you, Lord Nesby. I think I remember, I recall uh, Gamini Risana, the late Gamini Risanaka's son recently. He's a politician at the moment. And I uh, recall in a very recent interview, him talking about his father's role to play in us uh, getting cricket, I mean, just state us as a cricketing nation. He brought this up very recently. So, yeah. Also, you mentioned Sangakar. I actually spoke to him because I was going to ask you about his role at the MCC. And he had very nice things to say about you. That you're a very nice person. And he said he's met you a few times. Um, we are very proud of him. He's one of our cricketing legends. And he probably will go down as one of the top uh, five or ten. One of the best uh, ambassadors we've had as a country. And uh, we are not fully equipped to understand his role there. But I just want to know straight from you. As the head of the MCC, what is the kind of uh, thing that Sangakkara does and how much pride should we really put behind him uh, that he has achieved this? Well, it's a great honour for any cricketer to become president of the MCC. But uh, our dear friend Kumar uh, is a legend here. I mean, he played for Surrey as well. Not a bad team. Uh, not as good as Northamptonshire, but it's quite good. <laughs> no, seriously. And he's such a nice man and a very accomplished cricketer. And he's a wonderful ambassador. That's the role he is now. You have to remember that the MCC, the Mulleran County Cricket Club, uh, still controls the laws of the game. They're not controlled by the English, uh, uh, people, the English County Board or whatever it's called or the government or anybody else. It's controlled by the MCC. So he's the top man there. He's not the top executive, but he's the figurehead. And because of this particular problem we've had with COVID-19, he's actually doing two years as president, which is a wonderful tribute to him. Because if he'd not been very good, they wouldn't have offered it. <laughs> so everybody loves Kumar. Thank you for your kind words. I'll make sure he hears this straight from you. Uh, moving on to some other things, Lord Nesby. Um, I, I mean, your book is titled Paradise Lost, Paradise Regained, Sri Lanka Paradise Lost, Paradise Regained. I think there is no better word befitting our little island than the word paradise because it actually, I've traveled quite a bit too, but I've never seen a place as gorgeous as ours. Uh, right. The only thing we seem to not be able to get rid of for the longest time that we are plagued with is this divide, this ethnic divide that we've suffered for over three and now going on four decades. And you are not a, a stranger to this discussion. You've overseen a lot of uh, years that we've been through this divide. So my question to you is, would you say that the original, the primary ethnic divide has some connection with the fact that there was a divide and conquer policy Back in the day when we were ruled under the British Empire, there was a divide and conquer policy. Would you say that that has anything to do with the beginnings or the primary reasons for an ethnic divide to start back in um, the 50s? Um, I'm afraid it has a lot to do with it. The British government at the time, when you were a colony as Ceylon, had a uh, strategy uh, that uh, the Tamil the mi minority uh, should be dominant in the civil service. Uh, there was also no effort made to ensure that uh, all the young people in Ossilom learned the two main languages. People in the Sinhalese group learned Sinhala, and in the Tamil area they learned Tamil. So that was a problem, looking back, big problem. There was also a special percentage uh, of uh, admission to the universities. Um, 
I think uh, there were a number of areas, but the, you know that was a colonial period. That was no different to anybody else's colonial. Um, and you were brave people. You got your independence pretty early on compared to others. Um, so there was an opportunity then to put it right. Sadly, it wasn't taken at that time because all there was was a swing back in the other way. And I remember my secretary, as it turned out, that when I came to Colombo, uh, my secretary was given to me and uh, she was Tamil and she explained the background of the, all of this. Um, and I think it has taken a long time. But the good thing now is there is every child, as I understand it, in Sri Lanka, learns both Tamil and Sinhalese. I hope that's right. That's my information. Yeah, we are encouraged to actually do link language. I'm not sure if the deep south and the north kind of get into that as well. well they don't but for most of the island. You know, they ought to be. They're not. There's, I shall ask some questions about that. But they jolly well ought to be doing that. But the civil service entry now is done on merit. That's good. And if we just speak a little louder into your mic, you're getting a little faint. Sorry to keep so saying that. It's moving yeah. better. It's moving oh. better. More needs to be done. And you need to make sure that there isn't any discrimination between one Sri Lankan and another. I did notice, though, the road signs have changed. On my last visit, for one, the first time I saw, noticed that was 2015, where I saw the road signs were in English, Tamil, and Sinhalese. That's only a small thing, but it's a very important thing. So things are improving, but we'll come on a bit further to why or what, what's the, where the problem area lies now. But I think I know exactly where the problem lies. I'm going to get to that in a bit. I'm going to ask you that in a bit. Um, or you can tell us now. Where, what would you think have been the biggest roadblocks in the journey towards lasting peace for this island? Sorry, I didn't catch that one. Yeah. Uh, but ac according to your opinion, what would you think have been the biggest roadblocks when it comes to achieving lasting peace in this island between all communities? The diaspora. Worldwide. Quite clear of that. Yes. Not just in the UK, Canada, yeah. US, France, Canada, Germany, Australia. There. They have left the country at one point or another, either because of some of the tragic circumstances that took place, uh, or chosen to go away for one reason or another. But I was amazed that when peace came, that none of the Tamil communities in the world put any new money back into the northern province. I thought they would automatically do that. I was badly wrong. Badly wrong. And uh, we have just had a meeting in the UK because we have three groups for Sri Lanka in the parliament. The main group, which is the one I started back in 1975, the Tamil group, and more recently, a Muslim group. I put a proposition to uh, my colleagues, and I'm not the chairman. You can't be the chairman in the Lords anymore. You've got to be in the Commons. But a proposition was moved, and uh, uh, a, a doctor offered as the new chairman that he should get together with the chairman of the Muslim group, and the chairman of the Tamil group to try and work together for the interests of Sri Lanka. And that is what we have to do. And we have to try and persuade. I've been to see the High Commissioner for Canada. I've been to see the ambassador from the United States, not the current one, an earlier one, to try and make something happen. And that is a huge challenge. But it has to be done. Because unless you get the diaspora, on site, then it is going to be very difficult. Because never forget all the money that was raised illegally by the uh, LTTE is somewhere in somebody's bank account and it's being used not to help Sri Lanka today. 
Thank you, Lord. Um, my next question is, uh, do you think as an island since 2009, since the war came to an end, would you say that we've had satisfactory progress on the road to reconciliation? We've certainly tried very hard. Uh, I, think, I believe most, almost all the military land that was requisitioned uh, during the war and up to the war has been handed back. Uh, there are obviously a few places where there have been uh, hang-ups, those exactly who owned it before the hound. Uh, power and is now, there's a complete network of power in the northern province, which there wasn't before. Uh, so yes, there's been good progress. There's been a, a, a census held in the uh, northern region after the war to see exactly what happened. Because, uh, you know, if there was extensive rape, as alleged, uh, then that would have shown up in the birth certificate. There's enough evidence elsewhere in the world to suggest that it, that, is the, that is the best place to establish the extent of uh, rape. And I'm sorry to put it that way. But there is no sign there. That doesn't mean there haven't been individual cases. That I can't comment on. But I'm confident that that work done by... Tamil enunciators, risen up by Tamil officers, is a very good step forward. The missing person uh, bureau, working too slowly, in my judgment, needs to speed up. Um, the Paragama Commission did a lot of very good work on finding the families who alleged that their loved, beloved ones were killed. The ICRC, who I always, the International Red Cross, who I always see when I come to Sri Lanka, did a lot of separate work. And the whole of that work went into the Commission for Missing Persons. And the new uh, parliament, when it's elected in a couple of weeks' time, that has to be priority number one almost, to get that put to bed so that the genuine people who have lost families should be recompensed. But you know as well as I do, people keep appearing somewhere in the world who are allegedly killed during the war. Um, we never experienced that in the UK. We had a major war, two major wars. But we never experienced a situation where some of our people disappeared and reappeared somewhere else in the world. So it's not straightforward. And the one thing I'm asking the British government to do, and I will ask the Commonwealth governments to do, is on a confidential basis to make available to the Sri Lankan government, particularly the Commission of Missing Persons, uh, that the name, firstly, of people who sought uh, uh, safety, and secondly, take the list from Sri Lanka of people who have disappeared and have a look at the immigration names and figures uh, that appear uh, in Canada or the UK or the States. And I would not be the least bit surprised if a significant percentage did not appear on that list. Maybe it, <coughs> maybe I'm wrong, but um, somebody has to do that. Uh, and that is crucial. So we, we must make sure that we look after the people who genuinely lost loved ones and make sure the others who obviously don't say anything, but possibly know in their heart of hearts that the young man who's allegedly killed is actually living in California. I don't know. But there's too much evidence to suggest really that that's impossible. I see what you're saying, Lord Nesbish. That's exactly what I was going to go with for my next question. So, yeah, so there are different numbers put forward. We've seen different channels come up with videos. Some say it's in the tens of thousands. I have seen you comment that it is much less. There is a lot of people who are of the view that it's much less. But I think we can all agree that there is some number that was lost or missing in those last days. So my question in relation, and, and like you said, yeah, there may be a few cases where somebody missing turns up living somewhere else under a different name or whatever, that is quite a possibility. But taking into consideration that there is definitely a number that of civilians that could have gone missing and are missing and the cases are real, 
uh, we the previous government appointed the office of the missing persons. I think they were doing some work. I think now there's a new head of the OMP and they're moving forward. Keeping all of that in mind, my question to you is, Lord Nesby, there is a section, and you may know most of this section, of Sri Lankans worldwide and even in the country who believe that you are categorically opposed to international oversight of Sri Lanka's reconciliation efforts or the last days, as it were, before we reach the end of the war, that you speak actively against international oversight. So I just wanted to ask you, would you agree with this stance or this sentiment that they share? And uh, if so, if you could explain your thoughts behind it. I start from a simple proposition that uh, I'm British and I don't believe Britain requires another country to make a judgment on our operations in wherever they may be. Um, some of them are sanctioned by the UN, some of them are not. Um, and I think it's the same for Sri Lanka. It's a sovereign country. And it's been a sovereign country since 1948. And that's a very proud position to be. And that's why I am, in principle, not in favour of oversight. And it's made even more obvious to me when the initial work done by the United Nations suggested 40,000 civilians killed, it made no allusion to how many of the alleged civilians were actually civilians. I know enough. I've served in the military. I know enough about what happens in difficult circumstances, particularly when you have press ganged people to come on your side. You have to remember that at the very best, there weren't more than perhaps 20,000 real Tamil tigers. But how many were taken out of Jaffna? 340, 30,000, well over 300,000. And those boys and girls, some of them no older than 13, press ganged into the front, into the, into the army to support the Tamil tigers. So somewhere along the line, the UN never understood what happened. And I find it disgusting that the people who gave evidence to the UN, that is hidden away. It will eventually come out in another 10 years. That's not democracy. And uh, I went to the camp, Manic Farm camp, with my wife, who's a doctor. I read that there was barbed wire around there. There's, not, there's lots of barbed wire in Sri Lanka. Always has been. There's a chap called an elephant who roams a bit and needs something to stop him getting in. And I talk to the people there. I don't speak Sinhalese, but sadly. I speak some Hindi, but um, not much these days. Uh, my wife went separately. And um, so they don't know much about my wife other than she's a doctor. So she talked to the doctors and me, and nearly 300, 296,000 civilians saved. There couldn't have been 100,000 civilians killed, could it? Which is one of the figures that's given out by the BBC and others. And I have tracked journalists, doctors, others who were in the field, and as you know, I actually also had a freedom of information inquiry from the British military attaché, who was in the field, sending back reports every week. Some of those reports are in the public domain now. They've been published. I've made them available to anybody who wants them. Those clearly indicate the trouble that was taken by the Sri Lankan army to look after the civilians. There's one case where there was a boatload of uh, injured uh, civilians, uh, Tamil civilians, taken down to Trincomalee. And then a comment made from the um, colonel involved, the British colonel, uh, Colonel Gash, was, I am amazed at the care and attention the Sinhalese army 
are giving to these poor people who have come down, who are injured. They are being looked after exceedingly well, etc. I've done all this work, and I cannot make it more than 5,000 civilians killed. And then I ask myself, where are the bodies? Some people say, well, they all floated away. No. That's, I was there for your tsunami. I remember the 30,000 that uh, were, were drowned. So, uh, no, that isn't believable. And then finally, there's, finally, there's been a, an inquiry done from the space of how many bodies or graves they can find. So this is, this is pretty accurate. A couple of thousand. government that was in charge of the army during the last stages of the war, would you say that that could bring about a just end or a just inquiry on behalf of the victims that we claim are lost? It depends on the makeup missing. of the missing persons bureau, doesn't it? I mean, if the makeup covers uh, the, a balance and yeah. um, you have lawyers, you have good lawyers, you're a lawyer, yeah. look what happened when, uh, when there was an had foreign lawyers deciding on what was right and what was wrong. Okay. Thank you, Lord Nesby. My next question is, um, it is also widely accepted. I, I don't know. I'm sure you've been following the latest developments. We had the Easter attacks. A while before that, we had a lot of issues with the Prevention of Terrorism Act, the PTA, and there have been some arrests made even uh, this year under that act. My question is that this ethnic divide or this kind of uh, rift between the communities is unfortunately even in 2020 still real and still alive as it was. Unfortunately, we've not, I mean, we've made progress, but then we take two steps behind because of certain events that occurred last year. So my question to you is, if this is still alive and well, what would your advice, I, I think you gave part of this earlier, Lord Naseby, but from a, a third party, a person looking from the outside, a neutral person like you, I want to know how you would advise us on going forward on bridging this gap that is even alive and well today, unfortunately, even after 10 years of the, it's the 11th year of the conclusion of the war, but we still see many acts based on racial lines certain statutes used to the benefit of each party. My question would be, how? what would you advise this island to do in order to bridge these gaps? <laughs> it's very difficult. As, a, as an outsider. Foreigner. <laughs> yeah, as a foreigner. I think, I think there does need to be a Prevention of Terrorism, Terrorism Act. Act. Now, that act ought to be modeled on the PTA uh, that is used by a number of other countries. So I think that is one positive thing that could be done. Now, we talked about missing persons at length. That is taking far too long. You know, it's, it's manana, as they say in, uh, I forgot where manana is, Italy, I think. But it's taking far, far too long. And you have a, a, an election next month, in Sri Lanka, yes. the incoming government needs to make sure that within 12 months they have done all the preliminary work necessary to, on uh, with the missing persons. And I don't want any more interim reports that tell me nothing at all. You're very good at writing reports in Sri Lanka, but sometimes they don't actually have much meat in them. I'm not saying we're brilliant either, but um, <laughs> I, I can only comment uh, in the country that I'm trying to help. So, uh, uh, we need to find another Katagama. Uh, we need to find uh, a Muslim. Uh, you, you and your country have a lovely symbol of the lotus flower. The lotus flower, beautiful in the daylight, comes in the evening, disappears into the muddy water beneath it and comes back refreshed the next day. Beautiful. That symbol is a symbol of Buddhism 
and and uh, similar uh, similar. So, if if those two, if that one flower is a symbol of those two religions, the religious community should take a lead in all this. And I don't understand why it isn't. Um, we're disappointed here in the UK uh, that our religious communities have not played a greater role in COVID-19. I mean, when we were told that we were going to take out of lockdown um, uh, non-essential uh, shops, but you couldn't go to church, well, that's ridiculous. I mean, but did our church leaders really stand up and say anything? No. So I think that as a personally, and I normally used to call on, oh, I always called on the Bishop of Jaffna when I went to the north. I think maybe on my next visit, uh, I will make an effort to call on uh, the to the leadership of the religious community. And of course, sadly, uh, when I wrote the book, <laughs> I could I just managed to change it on the final proof. Ten years of peace, I thought. And then we had the Muslim bombing. Uh, so who, would have, who could have forecast that? No. Can't even blame, blame Sri Lanka, really. I don't think it was anything to do with that, was it? It was all to do with the, the uprisings in the Middle East, really. So uh, you have to persevere. You have to travel with hope. Thank you, Lord Nesby. I think the religious communities definitely have a very big role to play. But unfortunately, sometimes the religious communities are also politically affiliated or have to kind of back a particular political thought process. But uh, if they leave that aside and really look at things in the eyes of their religion, with the eyes of their religion, I'm sure they'll have a massive role to play and this can be sorted out much faster. Uh, Lord Nesby, me my next question, and I think I kind of have an idea of uh, what your thoughts are on this, but I want to ask you, um, do you believe the diaspora, not only London-based, but all other diasporas worldwide, the Sri Lankan diaspora, do you think that they can contribute or they have a role to play in terms of reconciliation in this country? And do you think if they have this role to play, uh, should Sri Lanka and the government embrace the diaspora in order to reach the reach this final goal? I'm sure they should. I'm sure they have a role. Um, you have to offer some incentives. Um, if you take, let us take the Tamil diaspora in London. I mean, in the UK, they are two thirds of the Sri Lankans in the UK are Tamil. There needs to be some incentive for them to invest in the northern region. Uh, uh, I think for any of the diaspora, there has to be a linkage available. There has to be education and, and communication as to what they are doing or what the government in Sri Lanka is doing. So that the young people, we maybe have to start with the young people to make sure that uh, the government of Sri Lanka is communicating what it's trying to do. That doesn't mean that there's any room for anybody who believes in uh, the independence of uh, the northern region, um, which was really part of what uh, the LTTE were about. So, um, yes, there is a major role to be done there. Thank you, Lord Nesby. Uh, my next question, I was looking at, uh, I was reading up on one of your speeches and you had... Uh, quoted President Obama, the quote reads, and I quote, we wage war so that we might know peace. And to a certain extent, I agree with you, sometimes it is the road that leads you to war that finally leads you to peace. But uh, is it not correct to say that in between war and peace, there are important steps to be taken like remorse, uh, reflection, and reconciliation? And these are the steps that will then lead to a lasting sort of peace instead of a very cursory sort of uh, ornamental version of it. So my question to you is, do you think these steps in between, like reconciliation, reflection and remorse, are important for lasting peace? 
and how would you what are your thoughts on this yes but you got to remember what was the war about elon independent state there is no government anywhere in the world that's been elected on a good franchise and in your case you get more people voting in Sri Lanka than we ever do in the UK and they are elected and you get other many parties but none of them were in favor of Elon you have had a situation where a very charismatic man who was truly ruthless eliminated the leaders of that community the Tamil community some of those who are I knew personally eliminated so that's what the war was about the government of the day and don't forget there were Tamil soldiers fighting on the government side uh, that's what that war was about it wasn't about between Tamil and Sinhalese so uh, you want lasting peace of course there has to be remorse that this ended up uh, as a war and it does need to be reconciliation of course that's absolutely vital and that does take time it isn't done in five minutes it's not done in 10 years if i say to you that my dear father late father worked in the department of war uh, reparations in london i asked him aged 16 uh, why are you still doing this work father he said boy i have cleared up about half of the challenges that there are as to who owns this piece of land who owned that piece of land uh, whether this person should have had special dispensation whether they were eligible for this that or the other and it took us the nearly and we don't forget we had food rationing uh right up to 1954 four so that's up to the times at which i'm 18 uh, and that is what 10 years after the war so these things take time but what you do where you're right is you do have to keep pressure and the leaders of all the political parties and the religious communities and the community leaders all have to keep the pressure up to make sure progress is made and your friends like me are there to try and help I'm sorry. Thank you, Lord Nesby, for those words. And yeah, we will rely on your continued support and friendship. Um, I'm just going to check in with Shehani because I think we were going to take in some crowd questions from the audience. So I'm just checking in with her if there's anything so that I can. They've been excited to ask you a few things. So just give me a second. I'm checking in with okay. her. Okay. Lord Nazi, just bear with me. They're just sending the questions through. Just give me a minute and I'll be asking you the okay. live audience questions. 
थैंक यू uh lord nesby the youth have been uh, especially the youth who are a part of the road track have been very excited to ask you a few things so the first question uh they are posing to you is what role does the youth have to play in reconciliation efforts in the island huge role massive role you are a lovely people you play the loveliest game in the world you also play quite good rugby i think Play tennis in your country, uh, and even we, as a the more mature nation, and now realise we are not doing enough to help the young people understand democracy, understand the need for a good economy, understand that to have a a community that actually works for the community. So if we've only just learnt it, it's not surprising you guys haven't got too far either. So they are so important to you. so important i think you brought up something that was on my mind lord nesby i think sports has always especially when we really got into cricket in the 90s uh, and there were people donning jerseys from every community we never saw those cricketers as a particular minority or a majority there were sri lankans there were our ambassadors there were household names there were heroes and sometimes sports is the kind of healing balm and the healing mechanism that you need so your thoughts on sports being used in this way to kind of bridge this yeah, you divide can, you can see it can't you the football i don't play football but they have a massive influence the foot, the good footballers and the good clubs ensure that their players get involved with the youth i do see it with cricket because i and president of the north hampshire county cricket club we now have outreach all the surrounding counties that are not first class counties so there is a pathway for boys and girls to come and play cricket and if they're talented enough they can come through to the academy and if they're really talented they can play in the first the second and first team and if they're really super talented they'll play for england we only just started that about a year ago So these are developments that should have happened a long time ago but they are now happening they need every encouragement and you could do the same i mean i come and watch uh, one of the golf test matches uh, after the not so long after the tsunami a wonderful cricket ground um, so you've got it all there and all those when i was there in the early 60s now used to go along the coast road you see you see the palm trees with the with the whitewash on them for the no, usually only two stumps because the one the tree wasn't big enough and the little boys playing cricket yes wonderful thank you lord nelsby my next question um is um is um you mentioned earlier that the diaspora is one of the big uh, issues or the one of the stumbling blocks in the process to uh, lasting reconciliation and the question is how so if you can explain their role in curtailing reconciliation why you why you think they are the biggest stumbling block when it comes to reconciliation it's a, a section of them are a stumbling block because they are financing activities in sri lanka against the interests of the sri lankan people there is a section i am told i haven't seen the evidence uh that still want elan uh there's a section that's allegedly working with tamil nadu i don't know uh all i do know is that the sri lankan government must make sure there are pathways for the diaspora families to rebuild their links wherever they were brought up or whatever interest they they had or whichever profession they were in and a lot of them were medical professionals or accountants you're a very very talented nation uh and i believe that if we just change the atmosphere 
and create some initiatives that the diaspora who are uh, critical at the moment can take an interest in a community within Sri Lanka or a, a sport or whatever it might be, then that has to be helped. But so long as there's all that money left over from uh, the LTTE washing around somewhere in the world, it is not being much of it put to good use. And I would like to see some of that basically put into charities to benefit uh, the people of Sri Lanka. Thank you, Lord Nesby. My next question is, there is a accusation that many British media companies pander to diaspora sentiment. There is an accusation that many British media companies pander to diaspora sentiment. Would you say this is true? Yes, I'm afraid it is true. You all remember the films, Sri Lanka's Killing Fields, Sri Lanka's Sri Lanka Killing Fields, War Crimes Unpunished, mm -hmm. Channel 4. Channel 4, uh, yeah. We, I did a lot of work on those films. 90% mm -hmm. of it untrue. Fergus allegation, all wrong. Um, so it happens, it's still happening. Um, and uh, you just have to get a bit smarter at it in Sri Lanka. <laughs> and you, you are a very smart nation. You're, you're a very quick nation. Uh, and yes, it's a long journey. Of course it is. But um, you have to persevere. Otherwise, I'd never written a book. <laughs> I didn't know I'd better write a book. <laughs> you had so many papers. I thought, what do I do with all these papers? <laughs> <laughs> Fabian and I are getting our hands on that book, Lord Nesby. Once we read it, we'll be in touch with you again to ask yeah, you some good. questions. I'm hoping to come but, out in October. You yeah. Open oh, the nice. First. <laughs> I think we're planning to. So hopefully, this second wave or whatever is managed better, and then uh, we'll definitely love to have you. My next question, my last. These are a few of the last few questions, Lord Nesby. My next question is, um, just bear with me. What level of commitment to reconciliation does the government of Sri Lanka need to reach to satisfy international demand for accountability? There is always this issue about can things be handled indoors, can things not, what about accountability, all of that. So the question is what level of commitment to reconciliation will the Sri Lankan government need to show for them to have a satisfy for the for global players to have a satisfactory view that accountability has been met? I'm not sure I actually know the answer to that question. <clears throat> I personally, and it's just me personally, uh, believe the Truth and Reconciliation Commission that started in South Africa, then went to Colombia. Uh, and the Colombian one is a little more interesting in the sense that it uh, started with the uh, a particular activity of somebody trying to arrest the leader of the armed forces, not dissimilar to the, the situation that appears to be happening now in, in Sri Lanka. So, uh, so long as everybody agrees, that's fine. That means, but it's absolutely fundamental that Sri Lanka as a government across the bearing parties agree that this is the way forward, fine. And you can't have a situation where the UN, on a particular faction of the UN, demands that this has to happen. You can't have that. That's not acceptable. Taking that, thank you, Lord Nesby. Thank you for those thoughts. Just taking that a little forward, I think uh, one of the big... Uh, the bigger issues that both sides of the aisle are unable to reconcile with is this aspect of justice. That for those who feel like they have people missing in their families or people who have disappeared towards the end of the war or during the war, they feel that they have not received justice. So the question is, shouldn't justice be the first step for us to then reach reconciliation? And if we are not going to... Um, um, lean on or, or have an international inquiry into this matter, how would you propose justice can be served for these people asking? I think what, asking, I think what they're asking for... What does that mean? 
for me, if I were one of the families that had lost my eldest son, let us say, in the war, uh, and uh, the knowledge that he was the breadwinner, or whatever it is, yes, there has to be recompense financially, and an understanding, and a, a, if necessary, a pardon. Because it was interesting that the government, after the war, very soon made sure that all those young people who had been pushed into joining uh, the LTTE, they were all given a, part, a pardon, and no inquiry into what the role is that they had played. So I thought that was a really good gesture, really good gesture. And uh, no, I think basically, and that's why I keep hammering away at this. The Missing Persons Commission has to report, has to say, it has established that nine out of 10 of the cases they've looked at, they've solved. Maybe there'll be a few left. And of those, 45% or 80% are genuine and they've been paid out. 20% in their judgment are not genuine and they will not be paid out. Thank you. My final question, thank you very much. We've, I mean, this has been very interesting and thank you so much again for always speaking fondly of our country and always standing up for what uh, we are and trying to keep us together. Uh, my final question to you, Lord Nesby, would be what role can other international advocates such as yourself uh, make towards achieving reconciliation in Sri Lanka? Make sure. Sorry, do you want me to do you, do you want me to repeat it? Yeah, the last bit. Yeah. So, what role can other international advocates such as yourself play? Uh, advocates such as yourself make towards achieving reconciliation in Sri Lanka. I think the most important role is to the ability to ask knowledgeable questions. Nobody can hide the fact. There's a chapter in my book on the freedom of information. I never thought I'd have to go to the length to find out what Colonel Gash said, uh, what he saw on the ground. And even now, there are bits of it redacted. My judgment, and I shall say to my government, they should agree to show the redacted bits to your government on the basis of mutual recognition of trying to find an answer to the problem. So that would be a good step forward to find somebody to, able to do it. If it was my decision, if I was Secretary of State for uh, Defence or Foreign and Commonwealth Office, I would make that decision. And I would maybe even say to the to Sri Lankan government, right, we will do this. What are you going to do in return? That's the way things go in the world. Thank you for the interrogation. <laughs> we just right. wanted to, we wanted a piece. I mean, we just wanted to pick your brain. Thank you very much. We are really honored to have you. Lord Nesby, I think Fabian, unfortunately, can't make it to say his last words. He's, he wanted to thank you profusely for taking time out and being here. His internet is failing, so I'm going to do this on his behalf. Uh, it has been a pleasure speaking to you and this has been a very learning sort of moment for all of us. We will be in touch, like I said, we're going to read uh, your book and then we'll be in touch. Thank you very much for your friendship and we expect that there will be continued support and favour at your end and uh, we look forward to seeing you in the island somewhere in October. Thank you very Have much. Have a good evening. Have a good Thank evening. You. Thank you, Lord Nesby. Goodbye. Bye.